Hugo, thanks for coming on. I'm uh, I'm so glad we actually got to do this in person. We were just saying about being able to do an episode where I'm always on Zoom and finally get to do one in person. But I'm really glad to to actually be able to do this one because I've heard a lot about you, but then that was in cricketing terms and now with your popularity through Love Island, it's just good to be able to sit down. I think we're going to have a good conversation about loads of different things. So thanks for thanks Awesome, for man. Thanks this. for having me. Let's do this. So first thing, um, I would like to dive into to really where everything started for you. Like yep. actually go from your upbringing, your condition, what it means for you. So I think if we, we really describe the condition you have yep. and, and go into uh, what it means for you on a day-to-day -day basis and what it meant for you growing up. Yeah, perfect. So um, I was born with bilateral talipes, which is also known as club foot. Um, so that was hereditary um, down from my mother's side of the family and myself and my brother were both born with it. Um, and it resulted in us having numerous operations. Um, I think my one was I had 21 operations for the age of seven yeah, um, yeah. to kind of correct them. So how I describe it is like, imagine having both your feet kind of born backwards and on their sides and the operations job was to kind of bring those feet up around and back to kind of how they look now. Um, but I'm very thankful that my parents kind of got my operations done when I was a lot younger because mm. I can't really remember much of it. I think the last one, my big one, I was in a wheelchair um, for a year and a bit and I kind of remember bits of that. Um, I remember playing cricket, kind of sat in my chair, kind of adjusting myself with my bat and stuff um, to keep me sane. But kind of now I don't really remember kind of that much of it and kind of in today's world, um, when I meet new people, they only really recognise that I walk on my tiptoes slightly because I've got mm. a slightly shorter um, Achilles tendon which in kind of sporting terms only affects my balance and kind of mobility and speed and turning and, and things like that, just because of the, the less surface area that I have to kind of tread on and whatnot. So yeah, that's kind of my bilateral talipes. Um, from there, obviously born and raised in Hampshire and mm -hmm. we're here now at my family home. Um, and yeah, it was great. I've absolutely loved it. Um, went to school just down the road at a school called Lord's Wands of College. Um, where kind of I played a lot of my cricket and kind of worked my way up through the the system and the disability cricket system and things there to kind of where we are now. So you also have a brother, Alex. Yeah. Uh, Alex is older. Right? Yeah, Alex is two years older. Yeah. Now we were talking about this just before we got we got started and it you both have it. Yeah. Now that's because it's, it is hereditary. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's so interesting. Yeah, so. it is. And Alex... Well, when Alex was kind of born with it first, um, I think the chance of me also getting it were ridiculously slim. I mean, the odds mm. were un unthinkable, really, but it just kind of was the way it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't change it. I mean, it's afforded me so many amazing opportunities now, and I'm really proud to kind of talk about it and talk about, you know, how it's affected me and try and make it more kind of normal for other young people up and down the country because it hasn't really stopped myself and my brother from kind of getting involved in sport and mainstream mm. sport and there's a lot more disability sport opportunities now than there were obviously it'd be great if there were more as well yeah, yeah. um there always could be um but yeah yeah really really happy to talk about it i'm sure we'll get on to the that the opportunities for disability athletes and cricket and but growing up I've got a younger brother, so I'm yep. the I'm the Alex version. I'm, I've always got the sort of like the older brother status. Yeah. When you were growing up together, did you compete? Like, were you were, were you fighting oh, or mate, what was your relationship? Mate, like? you have no idea. We used to hate hate each other. <laughs> um, we used to actually hate each other. Um, but gosh, okay, again, bringing back to the sporting side of things, we were competitors. So, yeah. from well, there's lots of research on this as well, isn't there? Being the younger sibling is often really beneficial yep. for an elite environment and elite performance yeah. because you're always having to afford adapt and kind of adjust to compete with your bigger faster stronger uglier might i say that <laughs> alex um brother so yeah i mean from a sporting sense of view it was great for me because you know i was always in the nets competing with him or in the garden whether it was rugby football hockey cricket golf whatever it was we were always kind of trying to one-up each other mm -hmm. and i guess yeah that's kind of given us that drive and that the part of the sport and stuff that we love. So it, it is interesting. Like my brother Brad, he, we we do joke about it that he had more ability than me at cricket. Like he was the he was definitely the better cricketer as we were growing up. And then 
I had probably more of that inner drive. And he, he self-admits, he's like, I just got to a stage where I just didn't want to go and do that Mate, thing. That, and, that's and literally the same as me and Al. Really? We've always said ours, well, he might not like this. My, my father's a coach as well. We're all cricket mad. We've always said Alex works harder and yeah. really thinks about his game. Um, whereas me, I'm more kind of free flowing and maybe more not natural. Yeah, I guess more natural ability, but not as good as a trainer and, and thinker as he potentially is about his game. Yeah. Um, especially when you're younger, maybe it's changed more so now, but kind of yeah, similar kind of situation for us as well. Yeah, I so people probably listening won't know that I actually did uh, an assistant coach role with the England dis physical disability cricket team and I worked with Alex yeah. and it, he is a really he's a deep thinker yeah he, he's a real hard worker I wasn't able to work with you and see you play no. but i've seen videos of you playing in very flamboyant yeah. <laughs> something <laughs> like that and one of the nicer big, ways to say don't it. mind a big shot no no but um yeah it's just really interesting i don't know I, I can't even bring it down to anything like why that happens i'll have to speak to some psychologists i'm sure about yeah. why it is that the the older sibling tends to be the one that i don't know knuckles down more but then the yeah. younger sibling has that more open approach one of really interesting is um you've got like archie lenham at sussex yeah. who's come through recently he's the younger sibling of of him and scott and scott's a great cricketer as well yeah but archie's the one that's come through really quickly yeah so it's and i think scott's got great potential moving forward but yeah it's just a, a real interesting dynamic so when did was it always cricket so you said yeah. your, your family's cricket always mad, cricket but it was always cricket yeah so my father's a coach at Hampshire. Um, yeah. He did a lot of work with the academy uh, when he um, when I was younger. Um, a lot of coach development, um, a lot of the women and girls stuff as well. Um, more so now, does a lot more just kind of one to one work. But obviously, <coughs> that meant when we were four, we had cricket bats in our hands. Um, obviously, my brother loves it. He's now master of cricket at school in mm. Birmingham. That was probably the route I was going to take down as well um, before the show. And I'd still love to be involved in cricket coaching in some capacity. And then my mother works as a PA for a cricket company. Wow. So yeah, oh, absolutely cricket mad. Um, but I played lots of sports when I was younger. Lots and lots of sports. Um, I went to a boarding school in Hampshire. So uh, there was a lot of sporting opportunities there. So I was massively into my hockey as well, mm. which I truly believe has really made my cricket better as well. Um, just with hands and reverses and things like that. Interesting, because I've seen you do a lot of like reverse ramps and reverse Yeah, sweeps. I love trying to bat left-handed as well, even though I'm right-handed. Yeah, so it must have come from go. that. Must have oh, been massively. Transferred there. Yeah, huge transfer there. Huge transfer there. I like my tennis, like my golf, played football, rugby at school as well. Uh, when the cricket got more serious, obviously a lot of those sports took kind of a backseat and kind of stop playing them so much. Um, but yeah, I definitely think, you know, having all these opportunities in a variety of sports has played a massive part in me being able to perform at the highest or higher levels um, rather than kind of isolating just to one. Did your parents ever try hold you back from anything? Like if you were going into a sport, was there any caution no. going in anything with your condition? No, not at all. Um, I was... <laughs> I, I, mean, I, even, I even did things like karate and things like that. I was like a champion, Southwest <laughs> under nine karate champion or something ridiculous <laughs> as a kid. There's some funny photos somewhere. I have to dig them up and send them to you at some point. Um, but obviously that I still have my club to eat then. Yeah, so it right. kind of was like when I was kicking and stuff, it kind of gave me a bit more of a of an oomph when I was kicking. Yeah. So it probably worked to my favourite a little bit. Um, but no, I, they've been so supportive throughout. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually... When I was in my wheelchair and stuff, sport took obviously a bit of a backseat. I still just doing their catches against the wall or with father or trying to do cricket one or but massive into my music as well. Um, so I was very lucky that, you know, I used to play the trumpet and sing so I could still do that to keep myself busy when I was a kid. So I had a very active and busy childhood. There was kind of nonstop. I was always on my way to sport or music or yeah. school or there was always something happening. So let's talk about when you actually were in a wheelchair. Yeah. Because did you go from being able to move around into the wheelchair then back out of it again. yeah so yeah. what was that like having were you active pre-wheelchair yeah and, and then so what was your um, mentality so that? as i said I, I was young i was set i was in a wheelchair from year three to year four at school which That's is hard seven and eight years it was it was really hard um so what it was is i had both feet done so it was six months with a big frame it was our frame on one leg and then six months on the other leg and what it was is it was pin sight so pin would go in and out the other side mm. and as the six months on we would screw it around and it would slowly bring my foot up and around into a right. strong position but we wouldn't do that operation until I consented it so my parents waited until I was old enough or at an age where 
I said, look, it's starting to hold me back. I can't keep up with the other kids anymore. Mm. Um, I need to get it done. And that was at the age of seven or eight. Yeah. So they wouldn't, the surgeon said they wouldn't operate until I could give my own, I, I want this done. Um, so that happened. It was actually funny. So it was six months on each leg, but in between the operations, there was a tournament called the Hambledon Under Nines Cricket Tournament. Right. And I, I played for a little club called Weald. It's just up the road. And I remember I was still recovering from my first leg and I batted and played on one leg basically in that tournament. But I was like, I'm not having the second operation until I play this tournament because it was like the biggest tournament of the year for us at this tiny village club. <laughs> I was like, I have to play, have to play. And Hambledon's like one of, I don't know if you know, one of the oldest, it's the oldest cricket club in the world or something. It's Is got, it really? Yeah, yeah. It's some right, really good, okay. interesting things on no, that. It's got a, that a lovely pub next to it that kind of explains all its history and whatnot. But I remember playing that tournament one leg and then literally the week later, I was back in the wheelchair again um, for wow. my second operation. And then see after I had to kind of relearn how to walk and kind of on crutches and Zimmer frames and things like that and, and stuff. So, but again, I, as I say, I don't really remember all the kind of recovery details, only like snippets just because I was so young and yeah. it was so hard to kind of remember. But I remember there's times at school when, you know, I was in my chair and there's actually one time I fell out of my wheelchair at school when I was trying to keep up with all the other kids and like been playing bulldog in the playground. I'm like wheeling myself around. I had a couple of mates helping me or whatever. And like that put my recovery back a couple of weeks. I had to go back and have another operation because I broke the blooming frame and things like that. But mm. I always try to stay involved in things. Um, but yeah. yeah. So when did like a, a say elite sort of dream come about? When When did that okay, I want to play cricket properly. Yeah. And then there's the physical disability team that I potentially could get in. Was there, when did those conversations start? Yeah, so about? I was, I was in and out. So I played a lot of district cricket and I was kind of borderline county. I played a couple of rep games for Hampshire for mainstream cricket, um, but kind of get to the point where I just, I couldn't really keep up with everyone else kind of on that yeah. level. Um, I started playing disability cricket when I was 11 so really young. I remember I, my, so my father took over as coach of the disability side when mm. me and my brother first got in. I think Alex was 13. I was 11. Obviously, it was all adult stuff. So yeah. I've been exposed since I was very young. Um, and then I've had my first England call-up tournaments or whatever, I think, when I was 13. So I've kind of been in and out the side now since I was 13. So I'm 25 now, 12 years or so. Yeah, wow. Um, and obviously, when you're young at 13... <laughs> You don't really know what's happening, do you? You just no. get the call. I remember, I think it was a tournament at Malvern or Loughborough. And they used to call it like a Super Fours thing. Um, a dish out a load of kit and you'd play like a, it would be for the weekend and you'd play a tournament, you know, round robin or something like that. And they'd kind of just suss out kind of who's, who's kind of in and around the disability game and whatnot from there. So. And, and you and Alex are doing this together. Like yeah. You're, you're doing kind of going, this, we're, we're going to do this. Yeah. Always together. Do this as two brothers. Going, yeah. Going yeah. Forward. And I'm, I think one of the greatest honours of my life, well, he was playing for England with Alex. Yeah. 100%. I love, I absolutely love it. How old were you when you first played? International. Yeah. Played for first international was the Bangladesh tour when we won the, so I missed out on the first two doors, tours to Dubai and which Alex went on. Right. Um, <laughs> we'll go into it. Don't know why. Um, yeah. But then obviously went to Bangladesh um, I was keeping and batting and, and we managed to win that tournament, the kind of global first World Cup, kind of ICRC international yep. multi-team tournaments before it was just England, Pakistan, England, Pakistan. Um, mm -hmm. That was the first multi-team one. We managed to come back and win that, which was that trip I say was the best tour I've been on or been a, a part of. So I've done three. I did Bangladesh, Dubai, and then the one in, one of them in England. Yep. And I always say that um, that Bangladesh one was special. The guys that when we did the World Series, they spoke about Bangladesh all the time, and and they they really did talk about it. They said how good a tournament it was, and and how uh, just some of the stories that were coming out of it. I think that's oh the, mate, it was just so humbling and nice. And you know we're in this BKSP, which you know wasn't the nicest place we've been in, and we all had to like club together. We didn't have great facilities, so all we had was kind of each other. That was just really wholesome and nice, and really brought everyone together as a team. Because before then, it was always well, for me, it was always just going up to camps in Birmingham or Loughborough or things like that. So you'd spend two days with each other and then you'd leave. And then another month later or two months later, you'd do the same again. But obviously out in Bangladesh, I think it was a two-week trip, two-and-a-bit-week trip. And yeah, we would come together, meet up in the evenings, have a chat, catch up. It's just, yeah. And obviously then playing in the subcontinent is just 
yeah, it's different. Cricket's different out there, as we discuss. It's just yeah, it's, but, it's 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 wild how they how they view the game. How how that, I think that was the real interesting thing for a lot of those guys was talking about the cultural differences. I don't yeah. think anyone been exposed to something like that where they'd really no. seen deprivation. And no, then, and then, oh, you were in a complex, weren't you? We were so, in a complex, but complex. But I still remember. You know, we still got to walk around town a couple of times and. There are some good clips actually that um that Dale, our videographer, filmed and it's kind of all of us walking around and he has quick chats like, guys, what are your thoughts? And everyone's just kind of speechless in a sense that it's just chaos, like it's just madness out there. Mm. Absolute madness. Um I think as you say, it was kind of eye-opening in the fact that a lot of us hadn't been to a third world country kind of and, and ex experienced that and seen kind of what what it was like. So yeah, it was great. But you know what? Like with everything that's been going on, and we're not going to get into what's been going on in cricket recently yeah. with with a lot of the racial um, conversation that's that's in the game. But the one someone asked me about it, and I gave my opinion. But then I, I I did also mention that cricket is one of these games that is I love it in not just because of the game being the game, but because of the amount of people you get exposed to. Yeah. In the sense that you get so many different people from so many different backgrounds. Like when I played. At Sussex, we had guys from Pakistan, from India, from the West Indies, from New Zealand, for, like literally from every background, every ethnicity, every religion. And then that part of the game was also a reflection of society. The school I went to yeah. was a state school and we had kids that were boarded from Nigeria, from China, that yeah. came over from uh, India, Bangladesh. Like they, they were in our school and you just get exposed to so many different people. And then that really does create an openness to people now yes there are the spectrums and there are people at the far end of each spectrum who are not tolerant of other races yeah. and then there's people that are very tolerant of other races and that you obviously want to be closer to tolerating yeah definitely. but i think the majority of people sit there because the game allows you to travel around the world you yeah. play it in good weather you play it yeah. in many different continents and you get exposed to and other ways of living yeah and i I also was really refreshing hearing guys talking about being over there and being seen as disability athletes yeah what was your experience of that like did they did they interact with you guys did they ask you questions do you yeah. even get that in england yeah no i mean i remember going out of bangladesh our first game was in the national stadium and it got rained off but there was thousands of people came in to watch there's loads of i think they did obviously free or whatnot they got a load of school kids in and there was mm. so many people there's some clips of me being a fool and like hyping up the crowd running around <laughs> and so i don't know what i was thinking someone actually played them the other day and i was like oh i cringed a little bit but it was all good fun at the time um obviously this was i was seven years ago now so i must have been i think i was 18 or so so mm. a lot younger um but yeah it is it is out there they just see it as cricket. They just see England versus Bangladesh. They don't see England PD or England LD or England deaf or England visually impaired or hearing impaired rather. They just see an England flag with the three lions and the Bangladesh tiger and they think, oh, game on. Game on, let's go. <laughs> um, whereas here, I don't think it is, you know, we wouldn't pack out a stadium. Yeah, right, yeah. So... Um, yeah, it, it is seen differently um, here, um, but it's definitely got a lot more exposure to when I first started um, and things like that, disability cricket. So it's definitely on the right way. And I got involved, back involved in disability cricket once I left the villa this summer. I spoke to mm. uh, Neil and Ian and we had some really great conversation um, about where disability cricket's going and where it could go. And mm. I'm here for it. I think there's some great plans in the woodworks. Um, and yeah, it is, it is an exciting time um having this kind of revamp and rechange and kind of amalgamating a lot of the um different impairment groups together mm. to try and get like the best athletes going um and whatnot so yeah it's exciting times it was one of my most hot I, I talk about it all the time my my experience with being around the pd squad and not only because my own journey but being around guys that had started to really build and gain momentum in the game. Yeah. People were really gelling. Um, I spoke to you about this morning about someone like Fred Bridges, like yeah. shout out to Fred. Like he's yeah. just what a man, legend. what a man, Fred. But um, the whole momentum that they gained and it, we'd had this conversation, Fred and I, about how it was a little bit sad with COVID. It stunted yeah. that it progression. Stopped, didn't it? Really, really hurt it. It hurt every sport, yeah. but it really would have hurt disability cricket. 
and I think the the moves that have been made, not only by the ECB, you could start to see the inclusion that was happening. The amount of people that got behind someone like Callum Flynn yeah. recently in the, well, we'll say recently, it was probably earlier on in the summer, wasn't it? Um, probably a little while ago, I can't think of the date when it was, but people really backing him up. And I don't think that would have happened five years ago. No, definitely I, not. I don't think that would have happened in my no. eyes. It's, it's really showing the change that is happening. I think the humility in yeah. the group was still the most incredible part of it that I've, I felt because people were very open. Ian Nen would always talk yeah. about how we're just, we're just amateur guys. Like we're, yeah. we're thrown on an England show and we're trying to be elite, but we yeah. do have our own insecurities, our anxieties yeah, and everything definitely. that goes with it. And uh, it's so uh, humble. I think everyone that comes into or has had the opportunity to come into our environment of disability cricket, um, and I'd like to think disability sport in general, would say they probably left a better human or a better person mm. just because they, as you say, it is such a an environment where you just learn so much and kind of p perspective is probably quite a good word for it, isn't it? About, yeah. you know, how everyone applies themselves and goes about their business. As you say, amateurs trying to be elite is always a tricky situation because um, yeah. life gets in the way and things like that. So yeah, it's it's such such a great place to be and uh, yeah I've, as i say it's, i've had some amazing opportunities from disability cricket and i think anyone involved in disability sport would probably say the same as well and i, I hope that it continues to grow and i hope that more opportunities arise for kind of everyone that has an impairment or struggles a little bit with things and that and yeah i, I think it's great the, the confidence that i saw grow in the group as well was really cool because when you're around people that have, are either going through similar conditions, similar situations, yeah. maybe similar insecurities, by simply being in a room, talking about it and sharing your experiences, that can open the conversation for other people having that experience as well. Yeah. Did you ever, did you find that, that when you got into the group, you felt more comfortable with who you were? Had you ever had any experiences where you perhaps felt alone outside of, of, of the disability bubble as such? Oh, so as we said, I've been in it in and around the squad for 13 since I was 13 so 12 years or so now and I guess I have some regrets from kind of how I was when I was younger within the squad purely because I was so young um mm -hmm. I remember there was a time probably when I was more of an established player within the team but I was trying to balance university life social life and cricket life together and I probably got that wrong um mm. due just due to the fact that I didn't really know I was 18 19 I didn't really know kind of what I was doing or where disability cricket was going or what kind of I was doing and potentially, and I think I was, well, I guess mentally you could say I struggled a little bit to try and balance it all, trying to please everyone and keep everyone happy and on side. Um, and that's on a reflection. I can, I can see that now. Whereas at the time I couldn't see that because I was younger, yeah. but probably slightly more, I don't know. I guess I was probably just got a bit too comfortable with a lot of things. I got a bit lazy. I got a little bit, as I say, I'm not the best trainer anyway. Or I wasn't. Now I am. Now I love it. Ever since COVID, I smash it. Like mm. gym runs, everything. But kind of at the time I was, you know, I'd rather go have a late night with my mates rather than hit the gym in the morning yeah. or do that run or not eat that burger or this or that and whatnot. Um, but I, at the time I couldn't see what the problem was because I was still performing. I was still in the middle of the packet on fitness days. I was still mm. hitting runs. Um, but that was more myself, myself, um, isolating myself or pushing myself away rather than anyone else. I think the environment in general has been, it's just been so, so good. I think potentially with the coaching situation, a lot of the time it's a, it's a, like a little project. So it's, you know, people come in, mm. leave their mark and then move on to greater things would yeah. be not a criticism, but that's kind of the way it's always been as yeah. almost like a stepping stone to, a county product um, project or more international project or whatnot. But I think that's always been, that will be the case or has been the case. I think it was probably the same with a lot of the women's game as they were in their infancy yeah. kind of with us as well. Um, so yeah, that would be not criticism, but that's just the nature of the environment and kind of where we are as amateurs trying to be elite performers. That um, was a re that's a really good point. And one, the reflection you've had there is, is very mature. Like it's really yeah. nice to hear. I think because 
you can get carried away with being an 18, 19, mm. look, 18, 90 year olds. They don't get it right. No, I, 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 did, I definitely didn't get it right. No. And I was a terrible person when I was younger. I did some terrible things in my no. eyes right now. Yeah. But as you mature, you reflect and you go, well, that's not really the person no. I want to be, no, the direction not. I want to go. But going on to the, the, the team and the coaches shifting, obviously I work with Sauls like yeah. in Salisbury and it was the same thing like Sauls I know just having these private conversations with him he was really about building that culture understanding yeah, massively, massively. who you are the one thing I loved what he did was he came in and he he let guys really say wear their disability on their arm but like literally show it yeah so guys who might have uh, uh prosthetic limbs yeah he would be like no get your short shorts on like don't yeah. put trousers on. Yeah. It was a, such it's a small change, but it's a change in mindset. We're together, we're a team, like we're proud of what we've got. And that was something really nice. But you're so right that he's now moved on to the professional game yeah. in, in with Kurt with, as well. Yeah, with with, uh, Sussex. with Sussex, my club. And that's that is a really tough thing. So it really goes down to the the group itself yeah. being able to hold on to that, knowing if the the coach is going to come in, try to do a few things, maybe move on. But really, that is that. That is hard for an amateur group to be able to do that because yeah, definitely. you've not come from an elite environment no. that it's all set up and built and there's structure around it. You, that's a tough place yeah. to be. And I think with, as I was saying about being younger, with disability cricket, there isn't the turnover of players that there is in the professional game. Really good point. So yeah. when I was younger, I knew there wasn't another wicketkeeper back come fighting to take my place. Mm. Whereas I think in the professional game, You'd there'd be twenty. Yeah, my most of my career maybe was, even more. Yeah, my my career was based on like fear that someone was going to take my spot. Exactly. Whereas I think all the lads would admit that as well in the current squad and now that there isn't, but but that's just because where we are in England, you know, we only yeah. have a small pool of disability players. You go to India and Pakistan, there's loads of them because they're so much more populated mm -hmm. and due to healthcare and things like that. There's more more players and whatnot. Yep. So for them, there probably is that turnover of players. You know, you get your, you know, your, your E-Jazz keeps coming back, doesn't yeah, he, and causing yeah. trouble. Um, but how old is someone like him? How old is he? Oh, like, his age doesn't become a real factor either. No. It levels that that playing field slightly. Like, oh God, he might be late 30s. Yeah, he like, must be. Now he's been Sorry touring. If you're he's been to touring. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure he will yeah. be, but <laughs> yeah. I think he's been touring ever since the first tours to Dubai. And that was... 2010 yeah, right. maybe I don't know but exactly that 10 a decade of cricket that's a great career yeah <laughs> a decade of cricket um so yeah the, I think as I say the new plans look really good um the fact that they're kind of putting the best LD and the hearing impaired players together with us PD guys I think can only lift the standard but I just hope that isn't a replacement for the internationals because mm. see the internationals are where you get to showcase your talent on the global stage and yeah. what elite athletes, I know we spoke about amateurs trying to be elite, but what elite athletes wouldn't want to to do that or have that opportunity because yeah. that's that's kind of where, as you say, the proudest moment is putting on that shirt, yeah. playing against, you know, touring, home tours, away tours, playing against the the best disability cricketers in the world. And I think that's what mm. everyone wants to do. Yeah. Um, I think if you spoke to anyone in the current PD, LD, Def squad, I think they'd all echo exactly what I'm saying now everyone wants to play the best players in the world yeah it's it, for people who have not seen a f physical disability cricket match you need to see one oh it yeah it is is actually insane yeah like the guys the Indian squad that yeah. we lost to in the final it was a guy who was clearing the boundary and I'd seen we'd seen a 2020 against Worcester the night before yeah Gupta had hit six over one of the stands and this guy for India has one arm and did yeah. it. He yeah. did the same thing. Yeah. Absolute same thing. And you're like, well, th this from a skill level, that's incredible. And people need to go see it because they think, one, it might be a different form of cricket. It's not. Yeah. It really is entertaining. No. And the thing that that really just got me was the the pace at which it was starting to to gather. It would be brilliant if India start to host a tournament. Like, yeah. I think it will just take I think that's, that's the... The dream place as well. I think if you know, you ask me, where would I want to go and play cricket? I would India instantly. That'd yeah. be the one thing, just because of you know, you see the IPL, you see other. I think the VI guys have gone out there, mm. um, and they said it's nuts, like crazy, mm. <laughs> and you, you just are. Oh. And that's like a the VI staff is obviously slightly more adapted game as well, and yeah. they're out there getting loads of people watching. So imagine 
I can just only imagine the PED stuff out there, the Paxton stadiums or the LD stuff or the um, hearing impaired stuff. Um, yeah, I think it'd be huge. Yeah, it's Absolutely exciting. Huge. Right, let's let's get on to the show. Let's talk about- What show? <laughs> yeah, what show? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Yeah, let's do it. Um, how did it come about? How did you- How did it come about? How did you get- I'm assuming you have to apply. Yeah, to so the for the show, you can either get scouted for the show or you apply for the show. I was one of the only, I think there's 10 starters, well, there's 10 starters that started on Love Island. I think I was one of two that applied. I think everyone else got scouted. Um, right, okay. But I was doing my master's in secular education at the University of Exeter, um, teaching PE. And um, I'd recently become single from my ex-girlfriend kind of in January. Mm -hmm. And I had a few few looseners, a couple of pints with my, with my housemate and we kind of got home. <laughs> it was quite late this evening, I must admit. And we thought, you know what, let's just, why don't I apply? And we say, what you have to do is you have to submit a um, a 90 second video just kind of talking about you, which is very strange, very strange. But I remember I popped my camera up, um, made sure it's good lighting or whatever, yeah. kind of looked the part and whatnot. And I submitted this video to them and kind of the next day I got a call being like, oh, um, Hugo, it's, um, oh, I can't remember, some so-and-so from ITV. Um, we've got your application and we'd love to take it further. I was like, it's a bit quick. I was like, okay, cool. Um, and then it just snowballed from there, really. I had five or six Zoom auditions because of COVID. It couldn't all be in London. Then I had, I think I had two in London. And this was over a space of from kind of February to to beginning of June. Mm. And then I got casted for the show. And I was like, sorry, <laughs> what? <laughs> and they're like, oh, you've been cast. So I was like, oh, okay. Didn't really know what that meant at the time, but I got invited to a press day. And that's where you shot all your, your photos, your intro videos. Um, you, you did stuff with the marketing team um, and whatnot. And that's when it really started to feel real because before then it was just a couple of fun trips to London and a few Zoom calls. Um, then I got another phone call a week or so later being like, Hugo, um, congratulations, you're in the starting lineup. And I was actually in the gym. Tell you what, I put the phone down. I had the best gym session of my life. I never, <laughs> never pumped so much. I was on the treadmill, just absolutely going for it. Um, put a bar through the window. Yeah, literally, literally doubled all my PBs that day. We were very strange. Um, and then, yeah, I had a couple more weeks. I had to liaise with the university. And obviously I signed a um, a thing that said I couldn't tell anyone because it's all very secret. So I had to tell a little white lie, a little porky and say that I'd got a job in London to my school. Um, doing some sort of um, like media business work. So I left my placement, I think a week and a half early. Um, thankfully, I still passed and got my um, degree and I'm get, I've got my graduation at the end of December, which should be good fun to see all, my, see all of my, uh, my old teaching student friends and have a catch up because I'm sure they've got lots of questions. Um, and then, yeah, flew out. I had to quarantine for two and a half weeks. That was with no oh, phone cool. yeah, right. as well. No phone. Um, just me, I read a few books. I read Mo and Ali's book, I read Joe Roos, but Mo and Ali's book is fantastic, by the way. Really good really? read, really good insight into kind of his upbringing. Um, and just a swimming pool and a couple of dumbbells and that was it. And then, yeah, and then it was showtime. Yeah. So you couldn't tell, on, you, had you told many people you were going on the show? By so then? I told my mother and father, my brother and my good friend called Kate because um, my brother and Kate were going to run my socials while yes, I was okay. in the villa. So I kind of had to keep them on board and in the loop with what I was kind of doing and how it was all going. So then you go on to pretty much one of the biggest shows in the country, really. Yeah. And, and I'm sure from literally overnight, you've gone from... I'm sure you don't mind me saying, like not many people know who, no. who you are. To then some, <laughs> no one knows to, me, basically. To then pretty much the entire country yeah. having a conversation around around you. Yeah. And not only that, because you were the first person with a disability going into the villa, yep. that's a different conversation as well. Yeah. What was the first night experience? Like bar what was going on, on the show, but sort of the did you have an idea of the popularity that's happening back home? Or no, you're really secluded. So when you're in there, all you know is what's in those four walls. Yeah, okay. All you know is what's in those four walls. So you only can gauge how something's gone down or, you know, like a conversation or argument or something from everyone's reaction within the villa. You don't know the perceptions of the public or what's been put on the telly. Because I, I think I said to you before, it's a 24 yeah. hour, well, it's a 40 minute show every night. So the 40 minutes is encapsulating 24 hours of mm. content and 
things happening. So you don't know what's included, what hasn't been included. Um, but for me, I had, so I went in the show, I had, um, I had two fears. I, you know, my first fear was I didn't want to let my friends and family down or give them any more hassle. Cause I was aware about, you know, I've watched the show before. I knew how nationwide, as you say, the conversations talk about it. Everyone talks about you going to work, you going to wherever you're doing, every, someone's talking about it. So I didn't want to, um, let them down in the sense, you know, I didn't want to, give them any negative experiences or press or whatever, um, which thankfully didn't happen. Mm. And then my second fear was that no one would step forward for me when I walked in and that one did happen. So that, <laughs> that very quickly, I was so hyped to be on Love Island. I was like, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. Summer of love, meet a load of, yeah. you know, find love, you know, meet a load of incredible young people. You walk in, you stood there, you know, everyone, the camera's everywhere. You're like waiting for someone to step forward. You're like, oh God, it's not happening. <laughs> and then yeah. Professor Warren well, Whitmore was like, you go, oh, don't worry about it. I would have stepped forward. I was like, that doesn't help me right now. <laughs> All my mates are back home on the group chat roasting me. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely wow. obliterate. I can just, I could, could only have imagined it. Um, but yeah, another thing, obviously from the show, obviously the first, we spoke the first disabled contestant. One, I'm not sure that's actually true because someone may have had a disability but not spoken about it or yeah. it openly, come out, openly, openly yeah. come out because I know some people aren't as comfortable about speaking about it as I am potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to make living with a disability for the kind of the Love Island audience. So, you know, more, I guess it's quite a young audience, you would say, wouldn't yeah, you? Maybe definitely. like 15, 16 to... I don't know. I guess everyone watches I've got it now. Your old mates who are watching. Yeah, it, so I know, well, I don't know loads of people that watch it. So I guess there isn't a the time limit. But I wanted to make it more, seem more mainstream and seem more normal that someone who has lived with a disability all their life can go on national TV on the most popular show in the country and and boss it and you know and keep up with everyone else and yeah. and be a part of it and kind of really show that no matter your situation or what you're born with or et cetera, et cetera, there is you can still do and you can still be and and you still are, if that makes sense. Yeah. Everyone and everything that you could ever want to be and do. Um, and I know I mentioned it to you before. I think I, don't, I left the show with no regrets. Obviously I didn't find love on there, um, but I stayed true to who I was. I didn't want to fake it for the sake of the cameras. I could have maybe just picked someone and taken them with me and that would have been great, but mm. I didn't really see the point in that. But I think the one thing which not upset me, but I was a bit disappointed about is that I had the kind of the conversation, I guess the first conversation we had today about, you know, being born with club foot and my upbringing and how it affected me or how it affects me now um, with kind of everyone in the villa, every contestant that came in um, or was there while I was there. But it, I came back to find out it hadn't been aired once. Mm. So I, I, it's just a bit gutting that I feel like ITV really missed a trick. They could have done a lot of good for a lot of people in the country. I know I said one in five people are born with a uh, disability or impairment, impairment now. So mm -hmm. that's 20%. The UK's what 70 million population, yeah. 14 million people then is 20% live with a disability. So, you know, if these conversations were aired and opened and, um, you know, I guess everyone in the island as well were great with it. They asked loads of questions. They were really engaged. They're so interested. They loved hearing about the um, England disability cricket staff. And, you know, if those conversations, even one of them got aired, um, I think it could have helped a lot of young people potentially who aren't as comfortable with it. And, you know, maybe at school going through tougher times or not feeling very mainstream or feeling very involved or may feel excluded. So that's probably the one thing that was like, I was like, oh, that's such a shame. That is such a shame. But we spoke about it when I came came here this morning. Um, the the thing, the refreshing thing for me was that you had a almost a bigger calling for why you were there. Yeah, because it's really easy to be caught up in a show that on paper in the media is purely focused on external validation. Yeah, and and how you look Massively. and and that that was a really interesting dynamic when I heard you were going on there. I don't watch the show. Openly, yeah. I don't watch the show, mainly because I'm worried about the things that, that cascade from it. Yeah. And we can get into that. Yeah. But I think when I asked you when I came here this morning that you were going in there with a bit of a goal and purpose to yeah. help air a little bit more around disability and disability sport, if anything. And that for me is a, a greater purpose than what the show 
can potentially offer. Yeah, massively. So, yeah, I think that... It, and it must have been hard to not get caught up in how perhaps other contestants were trying to view the show oh. and use the show and maybe what's happened in the past as well. Yeah, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head, mate. I think everyone does go on the show um, obviously looking for someone, but at the same time, everyone is aware of the opportunities that can arise from being on TV for up to eight weeks of a summer when everyone's mm -hmm. watching. Um, I think it'd be naive to say that no one was on it for those as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as we say, yeah, for me, I, I, I genuine, genuine opportunity to make disability more mainstream, that, to put it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. That was a fantastic opportunity. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I'm not gonna go too much into it, but as you say, it's hard to not fall into the traps of thinking, what what's going to get me an extra week here? What's going to get me an extra day? What can here? I say? How can I look? Yeah, exactly. What what's gonna? And I would like to. Well, I stayed for six weeks, and I didn't have a genuine connection with anyone throughout. So the public must have been thinking I did something okay. So or I was, and so I'd like to think that they thought I was just being me and not really getting too caught up in the situations because mm. I could have faked it. You know, I could have. Just picked a girl, or, or well, I, don't, I don't want to say just picked a girl because that's very undermining. But I had a couple of girls come in that were quite interested in me, and I respectfully said, "Oh, it's not going to work." Um, I could have maybe just gone with gone gone for it and just dived head in and been like, "Yeah, cool, let's do it. Let's let's just ride the wave of the show." Um, but I didn't, and. Um, I'm not saying other people did do that at all. Um, cause actually the couples that left the show look like they're absolutely loving it. They look like they're smashing it. Mm. Um, they look like they're really happy and genuinely happy. So, um, yeah, kudos to them cause they were absolutely killing it. And it's great. I, we don't speak that much everyone because everyone's got their own goals and their own targets that they're trying to achieve. Yep. But you know, when you do bump into the events or the odd chat here and there, it's actually so nice to see how well everyone's doing and how, you know, everyone's loving it and enjoying the experience because as you say, some, or as we, some people, obviously there's some negative connotations to the show and about how the aftermath can affect you. Yeah. So before we get on to that, um, you, you'd mentioned that you stay true to yourself on the, on yeah. the show, which I think is a beautiful thing to say. Like, yeah. It's a really nice phrase. Do you think that that has come from your, um, personal growth that you've had like if you say Hugo at 18 yeah Hugo now at 25 do you think that a part of that growth has allowed you to to stay true to, to oh, oh massively massively I also the biggest thing for me is that if I wasn't myself when I came home everyone would call me out for it yeah right yeah and yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean the only the you only can't hide from that in sport either no yeah exactly people in sport level exactly. yeah, which is good and uh, the only people's opinions and feelings I really truly care about are the ones that are my nearest and dearest, you know, my mm -hmm. best boys, my best mates, my best friends, my, my family. Um, so if I'd gone in there and was someone else or a person I wasn't, then as soon as I got home, they would have been like, Hugo, what are you doing? Yeah. What were you doing? And then, then not only have I lost, then I may have appeased the public, but they're not there for me when I'm down. They're not going to pick me up or, you know, put me in my place where I need to be. If I lose those guys, my nearest and dearest, my friends and family, then what do you actually have? Mm. So I, 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 I couldn't BS my way around it. You know, I was just like, I've got to be me because if I'm not, then I'm going to come home to to a world where it wouldn't be as enjoyable as where I wanted to be. So thankfully, um, all my mates are fully on board with it. And yeah, we, we have a laugh and a giggle about it nowadays, but it's my birthday on Saturday and um, I didn't do anything massive. I didn't want to do a big, yeah. you know, bougie event. I just got my my best mates that I've played cricket with or been around me since I was tiny. We just went to a couple of bars in Clapham in London and just had a really good catch up and a laugh, which which is lovely, you know. Yeah, so, that's nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I've got a really great friendship, supportive family group that um, I have my back and are there for me when when I need them. So, so when you when you left, yeah. were there any fears? Well, it could be even during or prior um, past the the show. We've spoken about mental health now. Yeah, I think there's been three three people that have been attributed to the show that have, have committed suicide. Yeah. So was what is the were there any fears of anything that you might come up against when you were leaving the show? Or 
do ITV assist in that? Do you get any sort of idea of <laughs> yeah, so, what you might come up against? So ITV, so I now have a welfare team. So I've got a welfare manager no way. who speaks to me every week. We have a nice call. I've got a psych and a therapist. So the psych, I only speak to if I request to speak to her. Um, the therapist, I have meetings <clears throat> every fortnight. Um, but a lot of those therapy sessions are, um, Hugo, how's it going? Yeah, good. How's work? Excuse me. Yeah, good. Um, any concerns at the minute that you want to talk about or air? I was like, no, not really. Um, so it's more just a chit chat because thankfully I'm I'm in a really good place right now, which I'm yeah. very, very thankful for. Um, so those are quite short, but yeah, they've, they've got that in place for every Islander um, that came with the show this year. Obviously I can't speak for previous years yeah. because I, I wasn't there. Um, but that's great. When I first got out of the villa, did I have any genuine concerns? Um, well, obviously you don't have a clue what people think of you. I had a few moments in there where I was... So when I when I speak about mental health, I consider it on a spectrum. Mm. Same as physical health. I, it's not you have mental health problems and that's it. It's, you know, sometimes your mental health is in a good place. Sometimes your mental health is in a not so good place. And you work up and down that spectrum rather than being labelled as you have mental health issues or you don't have mental health issues. I think everyone has good days and bad days, right? And I feel it's a dangerous place to be if you just, you know, throw it on someone. You have mental health issues, you have mental health issues, or you don't, because those guys that you say they don't, they might do. They mm. might have days when they're questioning or they're a bit anxious or they're a bit on edge or whatnot. You don't know what they're thinking. Um, So I mean, even when I was in the villa, I think I mentioned the word mental health once. I said, oh, I'm actually mentally... I'm not in this probably the worst I've been to been in the villa. And that's because I had um had not pro there was a challenge where I didn't get picked and everyone else did. And I was just stood in the sun for four hours feeling basically unwanted. So I was just like, I'm really not in a great place right now, like compared to where I have been. Um and they flagged that up. I got taken out, the site came and saw me, they're like, Are you okay? Blah, 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 blah. Are you right? And I was like, Yeah, I'm fine. I just right now I'm not feeling as good as I could have been feeling or can be feeling. Mm. Um so it's great that they cover you. And they have your back. But I also feel there is still like a taboo about all of it. And potentially some people don't like talking about it because they don't want to be pigeonholed as someone with potentially mental health problems. Because there's still kind of a, not a negative connotation, but I guess a negative connotation around it. Um, as, as, but it is great that it's getting so much better. I feel yeah. like a lot, a lot of people are now more comfortable talking about it. I, I'll happily say there's times where I'm anxious or there's times where I think, you know, there's days where, you know, I stay in bed a little bit longer because I don't potentially want to get out now. And, and But there's also other days when, you know, I jump out of bed because I've got an amazing podcast to record or, yeah, you know, yeah. there's times where, so I think it needs, I think mental health needs to be seen as a lot more liquid as opposed to solidly you have yeah. issues or problems or you don't have issues or problems. Because I guarantee you, the ones you say that don't will yeah. and the ones you say, oh, they will have days where they feel better or they get better because they've got support and they're open about it. So, yeah, as I say, I came out of the villa. The first person I obviously called my parents. It was a quite emotional call, as you can imagine. Um, so I hadn't spoke to them for two months straight. I hadn't done that in years. I had never done that. That was the longest I'd been without speaking to them. Wow. So that was great. And then I, um, I actually, the next person I called was my ex-girlfriend because that can't have been an enjoyable experience for her. So I wanted to wow. check up on her just because I wanted to make sure she was all right. See, you know, wasn't the nicest of conversations as you can imagine because she didn't know that I was going on. Um, she didn't. She didn't know that you. No, were going she didn't on. know. So I was it was a surprise on. when yeah, you were on the TV. Yeah, when I came in. Um, I actually spoke to my mother, and I got her to call. I'm not going to say it, I got her to call the ex girlfriend before I got announced because I wanted um, her to be able to prepare herself a little bit. So I got to call her the day before I got announced a week before the show. Mm. So obviously I couldn't do it myself because I was in quarantine in Spain. Yeah, I didn't have a phone. Said, yeah. yeah, so I wasn't allowed to. Um, so I got my mother to do that and check up on her while I was away. Um, and then I, before you know it, I was flying back. So then I got to, I had to do five days quarantine here, which was quite nice because it gave me time to just... A bit of decompression. Decompress. But at the same time, it wasn't really decompression because my phone was going, <laughs> interviews, media stuff, see all my socials catching up on or mm. everything. I mean, I think when I first got out of the villa, I got 20 messages a minute maybe for that first week or so, first couple of weeks. 
now I may get, get like 10 an hour of random messages from like message requests or whatnot. So obviously nowhere near as bad, but at the time, obviously it's overnight fame. So I didn't know what really what I was doing. And this is when people ask me, I would say, every day I'm learning in this new world. You know, I wasn't built for this world. I had no intentions of becoming an influencer or content creator or when I was younger, I, it wasn't like a goal of mine. It wasn't mm -hmm. a dream. Um, I want to be a professional cricketer. Um, but obviously now every day I'm learning. So I learn from others I work with. Obviously I've got a great management team that have my back and fill me in and help me find amazing opportunities and things like that. Um, so I've got a couple of friends on the show I still talk to uh, quite a lot, a handful or so. Because um, they're the only people that really generally understand what we're going through. Yeah. Because no one else gets it really. You know, you can speak to your friends and family and whatnot, but they, they weren't there. They can't draw on any past experiences to help you through life now because they they can't they don't know what they're what they're doing i think there's been times when we had not bickers but you know some of my mates or family have been like oh you should be doing this or you should be doing that or i didn't like that or i, I really like this and i'm like well i appreciate what you're saying and i and i really thank you but you, it's, you just it's a guessing game isn't it mm -hmm. no one really knows so it's nice that i still have those love island guys that i can speak to and chat to because obviously they're going through the exact same thing as I am. So it's nice to call on them when needed. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to unpack, but I think there, <laughs> we could be, uh, honestly, we could be here all day. It's yeah, crazy. I think the, when you spoke about the, the liquidity of, yeah. of mental health, you, you totally right there. I'm a big believer in, yes, it's the stigma is changing. It totally yeah, is. Thank, and the, thankfully it really is. And, and it is a show. I actually think love Island was a real big catalyst for the conversation as well, because it was a conversation in a show that, probably didn't have the awareness and, and mental no. health is, is really about awareness. That's yeah. what I'm coaching and teaching athletes and really about ultimately, once you become aware of something, you can start to change it. Yeah. And then if you have in your eyes, an issue that's, uh, that's happening, but you're not aware of it, then it's only going to snowball internally. And then it, it can manifest itself in whatever cascade of negative outcomes that could probably be, there. Yeah. it could be, it could be um, a substance abuse. It could be fighting with a, a, a relationship. Yeah. It could be shortness. It could be temper change of mood swings. It could be anything. Yeah. And But if you start to bring that awareness through it, and, and it is sad that the outcomes that have come from the show in the past, but again, the work that I didn't know that that sort of stuff was going on in the background with, with the show, the people that, yeah. you, that are now assisting you yeah. maybe weren't there before. Yeah. But that is at least, even just through this conversation, if people can be aware that it's taking someone who's gone on the show, got this this, this fame, has now got all of these resources at their disposal. Yeah. It's almost like with it's like Spider-Man, with great response, but with great power yeah, comes great responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people probably don't think that having a therapist is healthy. They may think that speaking to a psychologist could be negative. Yeah, exactly. But you're like, well, if these people that you're speaking to are looking up to, you're following on Instagram. They're actually using those people. Yeah. They're actually having to access them because in order to do something big and in front of a lot of people, it's going to take a big burden on, yeah. on you as, oh, massively. as a person. So I applaud you for actually opening up, talking about it and and accessing those things. Yeah. Is, is there something that you would say you find keeps you level on a mental spectrum where well, it could be physical, but on a on a mentality side of you that, that you do daily that you feel is something that if you don't, if you go without it's going to really negatively impact your rest of your day, your outlook of yourself. Yeah, exercise. Yeah. Exercise for me. I, mean, I can imagine you deal with a lot of athletes, a lot of sports personnel. I imagine a lot of them say the same thing. Um, if I don't exercise on a day, I my mood is worse. Mm. Um, and that's not just me being a like an, an exercise addict or a sports person. That That's science. Like your body, when you exercise, your body releases serotonin, all these amazing feel good hormones and whatnot. And it makes you feel better. It's, it's a well-known fact. Lockdown, everyone's highlight of the day was their daily walk. Yeah. hundred percent. It was because you weren't stuck inside twiddling your thumbs with nothing to do. Yeah. You ask anyone, they'll say, oh, the walk. That, that was it. That's what everyone loved to do. I mean, it was the only thing you could do. Yes. But generally getting out, getting some fresh air, um, that's what I say. When I when I last left the England squad PD team, I 
as I said, I was neglecting myself. I was probably making a lot of bad decisions and I wasn't being healthy with food and exercise. I was the biggest I'd been. I was 97 kg, maybe. But I thought it was fine because every the whole situation was amateur and I was still finishing in mid-table in the fitness results. Whereas I should have been striving to finish at the top. That's mm. what I should have been doing, but I wasn't because I was comfortable. I was like, oh, I'm fine. Um, but then the best I ever felt is when I started losing the weight and exercising and looking after myself, making better life choices. And if I if I speak to anyone, they say, oh, Hugo, I'm, you know, I'm not feeling my best at the minute. I'm a bit down, I'm a little bit anxious. I'd say, well, what are you eating and what exercise are you doing? That'd be my first point of view I would say to them. And a lot of the time would say, oh, I'm, eat I'm eating a load of rubbish and I'm rarely exercising. Mm. That would be their answer. And they'd be like, well, well the first thing you got to do is go for a walk. I'm not saying go and smash plates seven days a week, yeah. you know, and try and be the Hulk. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Go for a walk, go to the gym with a friend, do a spinning class, do whatever you like, really. But just, you know, get outside, get active. And it's even harder now with seasonal depression and, you know, mm. the day is getting darker and it is harder to get out of bed in the morning and it is, your days are shorter. So it's even harder now um, than it is in the summer. But yeah. Got to uh, make that conscious effort now. Yeah, you really there, do. I, I've, I'm big into my running at the moment yeah. and, and my... I tend to fluctuate whether I do my run in the morning, whether I do it in the evening. And it's just depending when I flip my two other, my other, so I do another weight session and I'll just yeah. flip it. But for me now, it's, I would perhaps go do that evening run at say, I don't know, five, six o'clock. Can't do it. Pitch now, back. I, I gotta go get a head torch. Yeah. But I want to do it outside. I want to do it outside. I don't enjoy running on a treadmill. It's not the same, is it? It's just not the same. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, the nights when I do a treadmill run, I feel like I am literally a hamster yeah, on a wheel. Literally, yeah. And, and I've done my exercise, so I feel the physical impact, but I'm not getting that mental stimulation of seeing this beautiful river that I'm running past, yeah. just seeing a few trees, just seeing something. And that that for me is the mental escape. Like, yes, I'm, I, I'm just jo joyfully running up on this hill that is just an incredible scenery, like the beautiful sunshine. And you're like, this is it. Like, yeah. this is perfect. And it, and that is, you haven't got to go do seven or eight K or 10 K or whatever. You, you just go for a walk. Yeah, just literally. Just take, take the dog yeah. out. If you've got a dog, like take them yeah. out. And, yeah. And I, um, so when I say I was doing my master's down Exeter, I lived by the quay, which is like this river. It's a lovely flat bit of ground. It's like a 2K loop. Mm. Um, and I, I, if any of the England boys are listening now, they will know I hated running. Oh my word. We used to do the yo-yo test. I used to cheat. I used to stop and just take a, tick like a mark because you get three marks so one of them i just refused to run it and take the mark and i thought i was being really cheeky and clever i don't know why um <laughs> but then when lockdown hit i was like oh i'm gonna get into running or i set myself a challenge in the new year i was like, i'm gonna really start i was like be good for me be good for my feet as well kind of get used to the impact before cricket season i started walking started running started with like 1k and then well no 2k and then i thought you know what, i'll run for 20 minutes, how far can I get? And then if I work my way up and I work my way up and it is amazing how when you're starting running, how quickly the gains and the development the you get. Is insane. Because you can't, I remember my first 5K I ever run, I think I was like about 37 minutes. I was like stopping, had to walk a bit. But in, in the space of four months, my quickest 5K, my PB, not to flex on all of you, was a, was a 21.40. That's it. So I cut like also 16 minutes. Also to note that that's with, with your condition. Yeah. But well, that's not easy. No. And if people will see like, yeah, running. What what sort of shoes are you having to wear so I, for that? So I really struggled to find a good shoe. But yeah. now I found a shoe that really fits well and works well with me. And I've ordered like eight pairs. I've do got you, so do you have to them. have like quite a thick foam base? Yeah. So I am a, so I only found this out once I got it into running because I started having pain. So I spoke to someone and said, I am a front foot striker. So I, when I run, I strike on the on my toes because obviously I've said yeah, I've got the short. Makes sense, yeah. Um, so I need I have buy shoes that have a bigger heel so that it can help get my heel down onto the floor. I wear insoles anyway. Mm -hmm. And it has to have a lot of foam, a lot of padding at the front, on the front foot where I strike. Mm -hmm. So I wear these Asics free runners or something and they're great because they've got really thick heels. So that helps me actually get my heel onto the floor. And it's got a really padded front as well. So my my striking area is padded. 
Um, so I was wearing some really flimsy shoes and you know, I was just getting in pain. I was like, why is this hurt? Is this my feet or is this the shoes I'm wearing? And turns out it was the shoes, thankfully. Right. So I could have carried on. Um, but yeah, shoe shopping is a nightmare for me. Yeah, I, Liam, Liam O'Brien, we I'd uh, done some work with Liam and and actually it was quite interesting. He was wearing such a foamed shoe that at the time that he didn't really have an idea of... of um, how his feet were grabbing the ground yeah. like and it is because it, his ankles fused so yeah. it's essentially can't flex the ankle yeah. he's no movement. very very tough um we actually got him then walking on a on a rope like got him on a battle rope just yeah. walking on it but it allowed him to like start to create a bit more dexterity bit and more he, feel a f- balance as yeah. well and he loved it and then and then he he is a great he is a really good athlete yeah. himself so yeah which is really interesting you know wondered what what kind of uh all alterations you might have to make in order to get there but 21 what do you say 21 21 40 i couldn't run that now i have i try to get back into running since i left the because obviously in there you couldn't run yeah that was actually one that was actually so going back to in the show that was one thing which i so before the show i was teaching so i was doing twenty five thousand steps a day yeah um i would then do an evening gym session so i'd probably do 90 minutes of weights and core and then every other day I would do a run, a 5K. So maybe I'd run 15 to 20K a week. When I was in the villa, we had 20 minutes in the morning maybe. So basically you wake up, the boys and girls would get ready for the day. The girls take longer than the boys. So we would use that little extra time to do a workout. So maybe tw- 20 minutes, half an hour to work out in the morning. And then maybe 20 minutes in the evening when the girls are getting ready and we have a little bit extra time again. So I went from doing a ridiculous amount of exercise to minimal yeah and that was tough you ask all the boys in there we will say we were asking for more workout time we like we needed it because i was I literally say like a hamster in there you couldn't run you couldn't do anything yeah. i was doing twenty five thousand steps a day teaching coaching doing all this running gym so when i was in there, i actually put on um over a stone stone a bit which is like eight kg I think I went in at 79 kg. I came out at 86, 87. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. And I was, when I went, to be fair, my balance, my healthy weight was probably around 81 kg, I reckon. I reckon yeah. I probably took it a bit too far at the start to try and look yeah, okay, aesthetically yeah. pleasing. But I came out a bit plumpy just yeah. because I couldn't. And I, I'm, and I, to be honest, I still haven't lost that extra. I think I, now I'm at 85. So I still need to shed a couple kg, which I'll I'll get to it after Christmas, probably in the new year. I'll do a dry Jan and yep. focus, maybe do a little veggie veggie month or something yeah. as well, and really get back into it. But I remember at the time I was like pulling my hair out. I was like, I just want to exercise. That's an interesting. That's an interesting point you make, like because and maybe you're slightly different as well in this case. But because the show is so <laughs> focused on aesthetics, yeah. And I, and I'm a, I am a big. I am a big believer at some stage where if you if you look good, you'll feel good. Yeah, and amazing. that look good is a spectrum. Again, yeah. I think there's there is some negative things that come out of the show yeah. with how people are trying body to, image. Body image is massive. It's thing huge, the show. isn't it? Yeah. So like body dysmorphia, for, yeah. even for guys, and and mm. that must be it might, you must have seen it playing on some guys' minds. I it played on my mind. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I obviously knew. I'm not. I knew I was getting. I don't want to say big. I wasn't big by any means, but I knew I'd put on fat. I was. I think all of us were. Oh, well, some of the boys got skinnier because they were losing muscle because they weren't working out enough, and some of us put on timber because we also weren't. Yeah, working out enough or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and we probably still eat, as you say. You kind of get used to what you're eating, don't you? So you still eat the same amount, but you're not doing as much. Obviously. Mm-hmm bloody uh, calorie deficits etc cetera, etc cetera. weight loss we could talk about that all day as well but it, it, you've got to put on weight if you're not if you're eating more than you're burning you're going to put on weight basically and that was happening so it was like on your mind a little bit um, but yeah as you say I think it's still it's not it's not an issue weight fluctuates yeah throughout your life you'll go up it'll come down if you put the work in you know that, yeah. that's the way it is What's what's your view on uh, body image in the show? Uh, oh, uh, mate. Uh, and the experience. I got in or... a bit of trouble for some of this stuff when I was in there because I said I, I were I phrased it wrongly, and I don't think the edit helped me because I said I didn't like fake. Yeah. Um, with relation to speaking about girls, so for me, I was talking about personality and my body, I suppose. So yeah. both the edit, but that was over like an hour and a half, 
quiz, but the edit made it down into like yeah, we'll forty seconds. Bit, yeah. So apparently, I said fake, fake. I don't like this. I don't like a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, because on that you haven't watched the show, people should know. Like you haven't actually watched the no, show. No, I, I you haven't mentioned that before. I we haven't started rewatched recording. the show. I, d I took a lot of L's on there, and I just don't, I lived it, so I don't feel the need to rewatch yeah. it. Um, and obviously, the reaction within the villa was very negative. So I only saw what I said it was negative. So I got really upset because not only because I thought I well because I hurt my friends. Yep. They got really upset. So I was like, oh, like, I never <laughs> wanted to hurt you. I didn't mean you know I was never. Was never sending malicious content. I was generally gutted that I'd hurt people I care about. Um, I think I apparently outside the villa there was different reactions. Some people were like, "Oh, everyone's allowed their preferences." It's like saying you don't like blondes or you don't like brunettes or you don't like guys with blue eyes or brown eyes or whatever. Some saw it similar to that. Some people obviously did think it was wrong, but it just highlights the body image thing, isn't it? Yeah. Some people. There are people, there's so much issues with body image these days because some people really struggle with it. Some people don't. Some people don't understand why people do change or do one out. And some people do understand it. And there's so much. But I, th I think the good thing is that everyone's so open to it now. Like you just do you. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. yeah. Who, what, my, 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 like, my opinion doesn't matter. I'm just no one saying what I like. It yeah. Like my, my only issue with it when I see, and this comes, honestly, it comes in professional athletes as well. It ultimately comes back from where you're, and um, I've done a previous podcast on this on goals and expectations mm. and ultimately understanding where your motivations are. Yeah. Now you, you have two types of motivation, which is intrinsic Intrinsic. And extrinsic. And there's nothing wrong with having extrinsic motivations because going for status, fame, maybe money, we need money to live. Yeah. But ultimately, there are external motivations that you can have and get trying to achieve those is not a negative thing because we all want recognition in the tribe yeah. of us and society. We want to know that we're doing a good job. We yeah. want to know that we're going in the right direction. The problem that happens, and I see this more, is that we only throw our motivations in the external bucket. Yeah. We're, we're believing that in order to be more, I need to do, do more. more yeah. I, I, I no longer am me and I need to become something else. I'm not enough as I am. Yeah. The trick and the skill is in balancing the two, Both, yeah. is in having the internal and external. So understanding like I'm going on Love Island for not only, yes, I recognize that I'm going to get some fame and people are going to see me, but there's a purpose behind what I'm doing, which yeah. is to promote the cause, the 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 community that I can represent. Present, yeah, That is an internal motivation. And I will feel good about myself for doing that by becoming that. So, and I may become uh, a higher status in that community to do it, which again, isn't a wrong thing because no. you can build on that purpose. Yeah. But it, the challenge we have and the thing you see is when people and young people especially that, that get affected by it is they're like, shoot, in order for me to be enough, I need to... Do, do this do this do that and and that's not the case meet this goal yeah fit this stereotype etc etc yeah so it's, it's and it's it's tough because of media and yeah. trying to sell a show you need to have the conflicts you need to have the yeah. negative we know negative media sells more yeah and i think that's where the the important stuff can be away from it on the influencer the social medias where people like yourselves can show like this is who i am yeah this is having conversations like this this is genuinely who i am and this yeah. is the person i am yeah definitely. and i have the issues that you have don't worry yeah. about it like, yeah <laughs> like, you, it's real yeah. so you don't have to achieve this in order to be enough yeah i think that's 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 something i've i've always felt with the show is is where people miss maybe misinterpret it from, yeah. from outside yeah definitely and I think you know I said this before it's a 40 minute show out of a 24 hour day the stuff so that's not there there's some stuff I'm, I'm not going to spoil I'm not no spoilers here but as you say as I said to you if you're on a show for 8 weeks 6 to 8 weeks however long it is um, you're going to have good days you're going to have bad days you're going to have good moments you're going to have bad moments no one goes 2 months squeaky clean without mm. You know, drifting from a, what they're doing or who they are, or whatever. That's just not human. Yeah. And a reminder that everyone on the show is human because mm. some people get way too, like, like you know, it's like we're just blokes and girls. Yeah. Going out for a summer of sun. You know, I COVID hit two years. I hadn't been traveling. I had this opportunity to come up, spend a summer in the sun in a multi-million pound thing in Mallorca. What twenty? Three-year-old's gonna say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
sign me up, get me yeah. there. So, you know, I think and then a lot of the humans are, you know, we speak about you know, trolling, let's say. Yeah. And like, have, you exper have you experienced oh, some yeah, of this coming Yeah, I've coming had, out? yeah, death threats a lot. Wow. Maybe people, yeah, people are savage. Um, one really sticks out with me. It was death, like- Death threats? Yeah, what? being like- Wow. Like one really like resonated with me. I, I don't look at them much, a lot of my message requests because, and I, so like, for example, I'm not on Twitter. Yes, I think okay. Twitter is a toxic black hole of emptiness yeah. filled with keyboard warriors who need to sort themselves out basically. So I'm nowhere near that. I dread to look on it. If you searched Hugo Hammond Love Island on Twitter, I bet it's vulgar. I bet it's vile. Mm. I wouldn't I wouldn't put myself through it. But why I went into the end was like, uh, I'll try and leave out the expletives. It's like, you are a waste of space and um, thank you for my summer and I want you to die. And oh. like, it was like, if I see you, blah, 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 blah. It's like, mate, <laughs> I don't know why I'm so rattled. I, I literally, I am harmless. Yeah. Harmless. Just a bloke that went on a TV show and it's like all this stuff. And it's just like, pff, whoa. So, so how do you combat that? Like, cause there's, that's, I, it's, it's a huge thing. So I go back to friends and family. Yeah. Okay. So, as I say, I'm because I've got a very supportive group of mates and family, the only opinions I really care about are theirs. Mm. If they think I'm starting to drift from who I am, then I'd be concerned and I'd start to really think about it. But have you spoken to them about it? Like have you openly said, like, I get these messages and Um my mates know because they read them while I was in the villa as well. Yeah, okay. Because there were so many that I didn't see because I was away. But Instagram, you can filter words now. You can right. filter loads of stuff. So I've got loads that are filtered. Um, there was one, you didn't watch the show, there was one moment in the villa where I stood up for a girl uh, in there because um, a guy chose someone else, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't really matter. But apparently pff, my DMs after that were disgusting. Apparently it was... So after every mo a move that you would make, it would fluctuate yeah. the input. Yeah, well, there was loads of love for that because it was a, it was a controversial and with controversy. Some people love it, some people hate it. Yeah. So there was loads of love um, for that. But I think there was equally as much hate. Wow. Um, and people are... The world I found is people are a lot more giving of hate than love. You know what I mean? So if you say I really like someone and uh, like I think someone's amazing, you know... Or say, not me, so let's say someone externally, they're much easier keyboard warrior and say, I hate this guy, than keyboard warrior and say, oh, you're a great bloke. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it's so true, actually. I, I, there's so many things that I've been doing, even with this show, for example, uh, people that I bump into and go, I listened to this podcast and I heard that episode and I absolutely loved it. And I'm like, thank you for letting me know. Like, but people don't do it enough though. They don't do it enough. No. Like they don't tell you you're doing a good job. You're doing it. And and ultimately, I'll say this much, I just need to know. Yeah. I just need to know it's I'm nice. going in the right. It's nice, It's that it? recognition yeah. I was talking to about. You want to know you're going in the right direction. And if I'm not going in the right direction, you can at least tell me to shift from it. You can at least be constructive with it and not tell you to go and effing die or whatnot, you know? Yeah. Like, and I think as you say, people are not easier to tear. If you do something, it does slip up or you have a little bit of a shocker, people are more likely to tear you down than if you have like a great moment, yeah. then like lift you up. I think that's really sad. Yeah. But for me as well, a lot of these, these accounts are people with like a race car as a profile picture or like a yeah. football player they like and they'll have like zero posts, zero followers and they'll follow like a thousand people. And I can imagine their fun is just sending these messages to all these people they follow or whatever just yeah, because they get a kick out it. of it. And that's why I think with Twitter, I think you need passport ver verification for social media because then you can track them down. I think yeah. that's the only real solution. So when we were in the villa, um, we watched the Euro final. Yes. We didn't know England got there, but we got a text. You know, I got a text where they show England are in the final, you're having a Euro party. Cool, we got to watch it. We watched those three young lads miss those pens. First thing we said, oh, they're going to get ruined on Twitter. Yeah. That's it. We're like, they are going to get abused. Mm. And that was our first reaction. Yeah. Like. The one I like, the, so Joffre Archer. Yeah. Joffre gets a, a lot. And the one thing I like what Joffre does, calls them out. Yeah. If they message him in private, he'll call he them out. He retweets it and like posts the photos. And he doesn't hide it. their name. And I'm a big believer in that, is that if you're 
if you're willing to say that in private, it's going it can come public. Yeah. On a, on a public domain as well. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. a bit different if it's uh, between two people that know each other and, and it's like, oh, yeah. oh, hold on. That yeah, was a, yeah, that was yeah. a private conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we know each other. But if you are going out there into a public forum, social media. Like a message request, like they don't follow you, but you follow them, they ping it across. Like, yeah. There's not, I think you, you should not be surprised if no. that person uses their platform to go, this is what I've got and this person did it. Yeah. Like, d- you're right. They, these people hide in shame, or not hide in shame, but they hide their identities yeah. through fear of of who who they are because they they know what they're doing. Yeah, they really know what they're doing, and it is it must be the biggest challenge that the guys in the villa faced. And yeah, you're right. The guys from that missed those penalties, they are. I felt so sorry. So for are we? I happened. didn't see it, but I got. I one of the first questions I asked is I got out. What happened? And they were like, "Oh, you didn't see the reaction." Twitter ruined, um, Twitter ruined oh, them, and there was a massive right, yeah. uproar about it and things like that, weren't there? So, and, and I mean, there was a, a tsunami of love that came after. Yeah. So there was a tsunami of awareness, but it is it is the the ugliest voice is the loudest in the room. Exactly. That's the, the real yeah. tough thing. Exactly. And but, and that's yeah. what I'd say for me as well. I would say I for every message of hate I got since the villa, I must get fifty nice ones. Yeah. So it's very easy to to block block it out for me. Obviously, I can imagine some people's ratios are a bit different. Maybe they've got more hate or maybe they've got more love. I don't know. I'm not in, I'm not, I don't see their DMs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very easy for me to block out and I say, I've got my friends and family. They're the ones, or like I say, the biggest thing for me is when I came out of the villa, I've seen mates that I hadn't seen for a few years because of COVID or, you know, restrictions are less now, like old uni mates, I'll go see them and they're like, put their arm around me. Uh, okay, stand two meters away, social distancing, not put the arm around me. I'll be like, mate, you're literally the same guy. Yeah, good. And I'll be like, you just haven't changed. And that means the most to me because I think it would be quite easy to get caught up and distracted and, you know, in this whole world of overnight, I hate the word fame and influencer stuff, but, yeah. you know, having a follow, being in the public eye overnight, you could easily get yeah. caught up or this or that, but... Yeah, it's, uh, I think you said it the best was uh, stay true to you, who you are. That's, yeah. That for me would be the biggest message coming out of this conversation. We've been going for uh, nearly an hour and 20 minutes. Wow, awesome. But um, I was gonna, we'll wrap up. But I want to ask, there's a couple of things I usually ask people on the, on right, the podcast, which is what is the best advice that you had been given uh, growing up that you try to live by? Best advice that you could be given? I think what we have already just said. This is the best advice that you have been given. Yeah, yeah. I think I've always been encouraged to be me and like stand up for situations that I don't agree with. Um, So uh, yeah, I think stay true to, you can't be anyone else, right? In your life. You get one life, you can't be anyone else. Be yourself and rock it Mm. and own it. If you don't agree with something, say it. You might be wrong, but then you can have a conversation about it and figure it out, you know? Or if you do agree with someone, I tell... Tell that person you like them, tell them you love them, hug them, whatever. Go out with your mates, have fun, but you know, just be you and 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 because that's all you can be. Mm. I think that's such a good mantra to live by. Because as you say, I think in a world of social media and influencing, a lot of people wish they had someone else's life yeah. or could be someone else. And ultimately you can't. <laughs> you know, that's it. You can't. You can't be them. Yeah. You can't. You can only be you. So you've just got to, and if you want change, Go get it. Yeah. Yeah. It's on you. You gotta own it. You know, and not everyone gets dealt the best hand. We know that. Yeah. Not everyone gets dealt dealt the best hand, but you've got to play the cards in front of you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so true. That is that's a so that's really deep. That's a really deep end. No, it's good. It? This, this um, is usually what comes out of that conversation. It is, it's it's really about that depth and the meaning behind what you're doing. I think that's come out in this conversation is the the purpose behind what you're doing. I'm I'm very excited about what what I think you could potentially do for for disability sport. Yes, yes. Getting out there, talking more, having conversations like this, um, really getting it out there, using your influence to to make a social impact. Yeah. Uh, not destigmatize it, but enhance the profile yeah, that's definitely. now coming. Get people talking. Yeah, I think that's really really exciting. Um, have you got a you mentioned Mo and Ali's book but have you got another book oh. uh, documentary 
or quote that you really, really enjoy that or, you, re- you recommend to people? You know, you know what? It's very on topic as well. Um, Dr. Alex was on the show yeah. a couple years ago now. He's just released a documentary on kind of like mental health awareness. Um, it's about an hour or so long. It's a good watch. Okay. It's a really good watch. And it's relatable for me because it's coming from yeah. someone else who's done the same kind of background and path and kind of for what Dr. Alex has done for kind of mental health and well-being and awareness. I would love to do the same for kind of like physical disabilities and awareness, for example, or mm-hmm. just disabilities in general. Um, I've got an end goal. I'd love to be an ambassador for persons with disabilities um, nationwide. That would be huge, you know, through the government or something like that. Um, I said to you before on a sports note thing, I'd love to do like a, be the face of like a fortnightly or weekly roundup of disability sport on Sky Sports News or BBC Sport or something like that. Because, you know, as I said, I feel disability sport only gets recognised at the Paralympics and so it should, but I think it should be recognised every year rather than every four years or whatnot. Mm. Um, So yeah, little bits and bobs of trying to get there. Um, That's, that's the goal. I like that. It's going to be a winding road. There's probably going to be some highs. There's probably going to be some lows. There's going to be some bumps in the road. Um, but, you know, I've, I've got a good team. Um, I've got a message I want to spread. And I'm going to do my best to, you know, make sure everyone who's born or develops or gets some sort of impairment or disability can be heard and recognised and can, you know, be mainstream and do it. So that's the, that's the, that's the target. That's, that's the ceiling. Yeah, love um, it. And, you know, I'd love to smash through that ceiling and go even further. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see Mate, how we I get I look there. forward to seeing what, what's coming. And that's, uh, I think that's a really nice goal. For anyone who maybe doesn't already follow you on <laughs> any social, I know we've spoken about socials, best places to find you? Yeah, um, Instagram uh, is uh, at Hugo underscore Hammond underscore, but you'll find me if you just search Hugo Hammond. Um, it's amazing what a blue tick can do for you on that, <laughs> on that side of things. Um, but yeah, I, I just post a lot of kind of lifestyle health and fitness um just kind of keeping up with me i'm kind of what i get up to and fingers crossed we can uh yeah get more of this stuff on there yeah you're on tiktok as well so yeah tiktok but that tiktok's more of just fun to take a bit of a tiktok's a platform it's like this golden egg at the minute like you don't know yeah. where it's going to go or how it works or how the algorithm works but you just post a load of fun stuff and some things smash it some things don't you yeah, just have I've a laugh got, with we've, it we've just started putting clips of the show on there as well because i think if there's one thing that i'm really keen on is is allowing social media to be an environment where you either you inspire educate or, or mm. entertain and that inspiration and education i think is what we can give from this show so we've we've moved over to tiktok yeah. as well which no, is it's it, definitely which is it's, it's an exciting platform i think no one knows kind of where his limits are because kind of yeah. facebook's kind of on the way down instagram's like in its prime obviously they're bringing out this new metaverse god knows what that's going to look like yeah and then kind of tiktok's almost still on the way up yeah so it's like it's kind of like everyone's cheeky pleasure yeah. i've got mates that were like three a few years ago like nah would never get on TikTok as a kid. And now that they're scrolling all the time, like, mate, they've got you. Yeah. They won. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, but all mate, exciting. We've covered so much ground. Uh, I guess before we sign off, is there anything that you you have to add or anything we think we have covered? Um, mate, just thanks for having me. It's been a great chat. It's been really enjoyable. It's mm. nice. It's, it's funny because I, you don't have the opportunity. Sometimes I don't slow down and think mm. as much as I potentially should because it's so fast paced, this new world. Um, so it's nice when you can kind of, dig a bit deeper and kind of actually really f- reflect and think because I think that's when you kind of recognise and can develop, isn't it? So yeah. that's been a pleasure, mate. I've really enjoyed it. No, thank you.